So what is an illusion? I am going to define the concept of illusion very simply as a perception, as a subjective experience that doesn't match the objective reality. So fairly simple concept. And we're going to have illusions in all various sensitive and cognitive domains. But say we're talking about a visual illusion. What do I mean by that? We're going to, for example, see something that is not there or fail to see something that is there, or more generally, we're going to see something different from what is there. Now, my training is as a visual neuroscientist, and in, as, a neuroscience, as a neuroscientist, uh, I use illusions in my research, and these illusions are not just something that we can enjoy, but they are a really useful tool, a wonderful tool. They give us a very, very good handle to get at the operations, the mechanisms, the algorithms that our brain uses, as we have seen in the previous talk, to construct, not to reconstruct. We're trying to get at the mechanisms that our brain uses to construct our perceptual experience. Take this illusion, for example. This is um, a variation on a classical illusion. Uh, it's called the trisonal space warp. What I would like you to do is to look at the center of this swirling pattern, and we're going to be looking at it for a, a minute or so. It's important that you stare at the center as carefully as you can. I'll tell you when you can look away. But keep looking at the center. And what we're doing here, this is a type of adaptation illusion. We are adapting our motion-sensitive neurons to different motion directions in different parts of the visual field. So. What that means is that these neurons are adapted, is that they're getting sort of tired, let's say, and the neurons that are responsible for a perception of motion in the opposite directions are comparatively more rested, so they're going to respond more. Keep looking at the center, don't look away just yet, but when I tell you to, please look at the face of the person sitting next to you, and you should see something interesting. Let's try it out right now. Look at the person sitting next to you, <laughs> we, <laughs> we call this, thank you, we call this emotion after effect. And something important that I should have mentioned, but I didn't, is that for about a third of the people who experience this illusion, it never goes away completely. <laughs> All right, everybody's still awake. So, why do we experience illusions? Well, one of the reasons is that our brain is limited in resources. We have a limited number of neurons, limited connections between neurons, limited brain areas even. In fact, even if you wanted to experience reality as it is, the neural resources for that you would need a head the size of a building. So obviously that's not going to be doable. And because it's not doable, your brain has to pick and choose what aspects of reality is going to sample and use to build this construct of the world. And these shortcuts are generally going to be very good. They're going to have an adaptive value. They're going to allow us to interact with each other, to navigate the world, to reproduce. However, in some cases, these shortcuts are going to give us a fairly different picture from, from what's really out there. So neural limitations can lead to neural deceptions. Now, some of the mechanisms by which our brain overcomes, most of the time, these uh, neural limitations is, uh, I'm going to give you three examples, which are going to be filling in blanks, seeking structure, and improving narratives. And we'll see a couple of examples of each. Filling in blanks, what do I mean by that? Well, in the previous lecture, Donald Hoffman told us about the fairly deficient design that we have in our retinas. The light enters our eye, the front, enters the front of the eye, and it has to travel all the way through the back of the eye, and where the photoreceptors um, are, are located. 
But that means that after all of the different types of processing of information that take place in the retina, this information needs to leave the eye. It leaves the eye via the optic nerve, which makes basically a big hole in your visual system where you have no photoreceptors. Now, let's do a little demonstration. Uh, in fact, the, what you see there in the diagram is not exactly correct. What I'd like you to do is to straighten both elbows, so not, not like the guy in the picture, but both elbows completely straight, and touch your thumbs one to each other. And now I would like you to close your left eye and look at the tip of your left finger. But pay attention to the tip of your right finger. And I move it around a little bit until you see it disappear. Can everybody see the right finger disappear? Again, close the left eye, look at the tip of the left finger, both arms straight, elbows touching. Yeah? So that's where the optic nerve leaves your brain. But let's do it again. Let's do something else. So again, elbows straight, thumbs touching. Make your, uh, close your left eye, look at your left fingertip. Now make your right finger disappear. Now that the finger is gone, can you see what's behind it? Yeah? How is that possible? You don't have x-ray vision, sorry. What's happening instead is that the brain is taking the information that is surrounding the missing tip of the finger and using that information to make a guess about what should be there where the finger is not. But the algorithm that the brain is using is it's pretty smart, it works most of the time, but it's not smart enough to actually reconstruct the tip of the finger. So in this case, the brain is taking a shortcut that is giving us a wrong picture of what is actually there. This is another example of how the brain uses very limited information to fill in blanks and arrive to pretty complicated percepts. So we see here three Pac-Man, and three patches of gray in the background. All that is happening in this illusion is that the shape of the three background patches of gray is changing, and your perception changes with it from being a two-dimensional triangle to a three-dimensional pyramid. And it switches back and forth. This is an illusion developed by Gardini and Gamberini that participated, competed, and got a second prize at the Best Illusion of the Year contest a few years back. Seeking structure. What do I mean by this? The brain will try to find regularity, will try to improve order, even when the information that we have around us is disorganized. For instance, here. This is an illusion created by Riora Kanai, it's called the healing grid, because it's a grid that is going to heal itself. So you can see that the center of this grid is very regular. We have uh, perfectly lined up intersections, but the outsides are all disorganized. Now we're going to make the grid organize itself just by holding our gaze still, pick one of the intersections at the center, and Focus your eyes on it, keep your eyes as still as you can, and pay attention to the whole grid, center and periphery, and you will see that the sides become completely regular just after a few seconds. Can everybody see that? So our brain is improving the structure of the physical world. Or take this other illusion, this won first prize in the 2007 Illusion of the Year contest. So what we're doing, what we're showing here is uh, we have some colored flashing patterns. And then, uh, so you can fix it at the center and uh, pay attention to these shapes. And the two outlines are empty, but you, we see them colored because our brain is generating after images based on the previously presented colors. But the interesting thing about it is that these after images conform exactly to the outlines, and they vary in color depending on the outline that follows. So we have here a red after image, in this case, and now a green after image in the same physical space. So the brain is taking this color opposing information and is actually fitting it to the contour that matches the corresponding shape. 
What's that? Uh, I believe this process is, uh, well, this illusion, as far as I know, it's never been tried with infants, but uh, this, uh, after images like this, uh, are a, a pretty much a process that is a, what we call hardwired in the brain. So I would expect that from very early on, if not from the very beginning, this perception should just be common to everybody. In fact, this is uh, one of these illusions uh, that are closer to the sensory level. And one of the reasons that we know this is so, that is hardwired in the brain, is that even if you force yourself, if you try to force yourself to not perceive the illusion, you're going to fail. So no matter what you do, and even if you know what you're saying is not there, you're still going to see it because it's just the way that the wires are connected in our brain. More cognitive illusions, like uh, some of the change blindness illusions that, uh, that we saw in the previous presentation, those you can force yourself or you can, your knowledge about illusion can affect your perception. But an after-image illusion like this one, even if you know about it, is not going to make a lot of difference. Improving narratives. So, as we live our lives, we're telling stories to ourselves. We're trying to make sense of the world. We're trying to construct a narrative around the world uh, around us. And, and this compulsion that we have, this instinct, if you will, to make sense of the objects and people around us, leads to some illusions as well, in, in some of them in the more, more of a cognitive domain. Take this experiment. This is called uh, choice blindness. It's a paradigm that was developed a few years ago by some Swedish team of uh, researchers. And what, we, what they did was uh, an interesting experiment. They presented uh, subjects in the lab with two sets of faces. In this case, we have uh, two women. And they asked the participants, OK, choose, point at the one that you find most attractive. And people would do that. And then they turn both pictures uh, upside down and ask the subject to pick up the one that they had just selected. Now, what the experimenters did, however, they had learned uh, some magic techniques from, uh, from a professional magician. and. So they were able to effect a swap. So now, this is, uh, so far, this is basically a change blindness experiment. Something has changed, but uh, we don't necessarily notice that there's been a change. And in fact, a large fraction of the subjects in this experiment didn't realize that the faces have swapped. But here comes the interesting part of the experiment. Now the researchers asked, OK, can you explain to me why you chose that face? Why did you find that face most attractive? And now, remember, these are faces that the subjects had no chosen. So in fact, it wasn't the face that they found most attractive. It was the opposite face. And subjects confabulated completely. This is a, a, a selection of subject comments. So you can see that the two pictures, remember, they're always explaining the opposite of the real choice. So this is radiant. I would have approached her at a bar rather than the other one. I liked earrings. But the one that they chose didn't have earrings, in fact. She looks like an aunt of mine and thing, and she seems nicer than the other one. She looks very hot in this picture. They're giving all sorts of reasons. Just a nice shape of the face and the chin, but not that the face that, that they chose, of course. I thought she had more personality in a way. She was the most attractive to me. I don't know, but this subject is honest, at least. <laughs> and there are even subjects that regret their choice. Why did they choose her? She looks very masculine. It was not the one that they chose. So this is, to me, really fascinating, because it shows that we are interpreting our own actions from a third-person perspective. So as we live our lives and uh, we're confronted with people. We're, we're always making hypotheses, coming up with explanations. Well, why did that person say that? Well, maybe they have a bad day or uh, they had too much coffee this morning. Whatever. We come up with a, lo a lot of explanations for people's behaviors. But we do exactly the same thing to explain our own behavior to ourselves. 
And when the behavior doesn't make sense, we try to fit an explanation that does. And researchers that have done these experiments, they have done similar things now for political surveys, all, all sorts of things that you would think that you would have your own opinions, your own convictions that wouldn't be so easily manipulated and even made you come up with explanations to justify actions that you yourself didn't make. So that's one takeaway from this research. The other takeaway that I find is that it doesn't really matter. Sometimes we agonize about uh, what's the best decision to make. Am I marrying the right person? Am I going to the right college? Am I accepting the right job offer? In the end, it doesn't matter because we're going to justify it to ourselves. We're going to <laughs> conclude this is the right choice. And it's just going to be fine. <laughs> All right. So... I would like to uh, show you a, a couple of uh, a number of other examples of, of illusions that uh, that we study in the laboratory and that uh, we have uh, seen come through through the contest and uh, and discuss a little bit. Just give you a couple of pointers of what they tell us about our brain and our neural processing. So we have seen uh, a couple of adaptation illusions, uh, brightness and color illusions. I have a couple of uh, additional examples here. Uh, over what uh, Donald Hoffman showed in the previous presentation. Uh, one thing to keep present is that for the brain, uh, basically most of what we perceive is quite relative. It depends on the context on which it is presented. So even with brightness illusions, not everything is black and white. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Take in this checkerboard A and B. They look very different as dark gray and light gray. In fact, if we suppress the context, we see that they're exactly the same shade of gray. We can go back and forth. Let's see. This illusion is by Ted Adelson. You can go on the web and print it out, grab a pair of scissors. It works just as well. <laughs> This is a, a very powerful illusion as well. Uh, I don't have the means here to remove the context, but uh, you're going to have to take my word for it. The, uh, we see this girl with a gray eye and a blue eye. In fact, the blue eye is not such. It's exactly the same shade of gray as the gray eye that we see here, but because it is presented within a red background, it appears blue. Again, a pair of scissors is the best way to experience this illusion. Or take this other illusion by, by uh, Boloro and Dale Purvis. So this is a nice example here about um, wha how some things that in fact can look, uh, the, can, can look different uh, are in fact the same. And that uh, I, in fact, I have to remind myself, okay, here we go. So, because <laughs> they just look so different to me. These um, blue four squares, they are, in fact, gray. And the same thing with the yellow squares here. So these four blue and these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I guess, yellow squares are, in fact, exactly identical and not colored at all. They're just gray. But our brain takes into account the background illumination, the context, and performs a type of a subtraction process and comes up with hypotheses about the real world that are, in this case, incorrect. Or we can come up with uh, illusions that show the opposite. So, in fact, here we have seen now the blue and yellow squares that were actually identical. Now we're going to see here these are red squares, one, two, three, four, five, here and here, one, two, three, four, five. They look basically almost identical to me. In fact, they are quite different. They're orange and purple if we eliminate the context. Shape illusions. They're illusions, as the name indicates, in which we perceive a shape that is not so. Like this. This is something that you can do at home, and in fact, uh, we did it in my laboratory with the help of a couple of summer students. All that you see here is, uh, is a bunch of Lego bricks and uh, 
and uh, uh, circles here, let's see. And that uh, uh, if you have any experience with Legos, you will know that these lines are all perfectly horizontal and vertical. But they appear distorted just based on the position of these little white and black elements within the tiles. That's all it takes for your brain to perceive, perceive curved lines where you have perfectly straight lines. And speaking of curved lines, this is one way to uh, accentuate curves and uh, create a slimming effect. Of course, this illusion and the dress, they, 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 they work best in front of a white background. So if you decide to buy it, make sure that you always walk in front of <laughs> All right. And, and speaking of fashion, now this is important for all of you to know because there's been a huge misconception in the fashion world and is that vertical lines make you look skinnier. This is wrong, wrong. So, so get rid of your vertical stripe wardrobe and time to invest in a horizontal stripe one. These are experiments that uh, well, originally by Helmholtz and, uh, and more recently by, by Peter Thompson of, of the UK. Notice how these two ladies, they're exactly the same, the same mannequin here, but uh, the one with the horizontal stripes appears to be skinnier. She, does, she appears to have uh, narrower hips than the lady with the vertical stripes. So there you go. Your fashion advisors have been leading you down the garden path. Mm. Ambiguous figures are a type of illusion that we can perceive in two different ways that are incompatible with each other. So we can perceive uh, one way or a different way, but not two ways at the same time. And this is actually important from the uh, neurophysiological perspective, as people have been searching for the neural correlates of consciousness, ambiguous illusions have been a favorite because these illusions can flip the responses of the neurons in a way that matches our perception. And that gives you a good handle to try to identify the brain areas and the neuronal populations that flip the responses back and forth in the way that matches what we perceive. So, so this is an example of an ambiguous figure that it has a historical significance as well. We see a bunch of violets, but in reality, it hides the faces of Napoleon, his wife, and their baby. And this is an engraving that uh, actually Napoleon's supporters used to hand to each other to recognize each other when Napoleon was in exile so they could uh, support him uh, from, uh, uh, without getting in trouble. And uh, this is Napoleon. That's the hat. It's in profile. The nose, the mouth, the chin. Can everybody see Napoleon? Not yet? Oh, my goodness. Okay, he's in profile. That's the nose. That's the hat. No luck, the mouth. Nose, mouth, chin. He's, he's in profile looking like this. Yeah. And opposite to him, we see his wife in profile. Yeah. And the baby down here also in profile, facing the same way as his mother. And we can see either the faces or the flowers, but not both at the same time. We have to choose perceptually what figure was background. Impossible objects, like the name indicates, are objects that are impossible in the real world, but not in our perception, however. This is an impossible cube. And it tells us something interesting about the way that our brain constructs shape. So notice how this uh, cube is not a, a possible physical object, because we have this, uh, this bar is coming both in front and behind. So the overall shape is impossible, but it doesn't bother us very much unless we look at it and we try to look for problems, because at a local level, all of these junctions are perfectly fine. So 
the fact that overall shape is impossible, it doesn't really bother us very much for the mechanisms of our shape perception. And in fact, if you, um, if you try, you can make it perceptually flip back and forth, even though the cube is impossible. Uh, there was a hand raised back there. OK, well, don't. <laughs> First off. Um, well, it, uh, it, it may be an issue of, uh, for me, it doesn't really matter, but it, it places a mental strain. These are, your, your brain is struggling to make sense of something that is, by definition, impossible. So that I would say that that is the reason and that I may give you, uh, when your perception is uh, out of alignment, uh, you may have... Uh, uh, some physical effects as well, sort of like uh, when you get a procession of vertigo or a motion sickness. Uh, those could be other examples. Let me show you how to make a physical impossible object. Okay, so we have, this is a sculpture by Hans Skepker of an impossible cube. So how do you make it? Well, it all depends on the angle. This is the same object from a different angle. So that's how you make an impossible cube. And you can make impossible objects with uh, uh, very large dimensions. This is an impossible triangle in Australia. It's very large, building size. Now, this is from a specific angle, and this is from a, different, a couple of different angles. A different way of making an impossible triangle, this one in Belgium. Invisibility illusions. Let's uh, try to, if we can have the lights dimmed for this one, I think it may work better. What I mean by the invisibility illusions is uh, we're talking about illusions in which you don't see something that is physically present and that according to what we know about the visual system, you should intuitively be able to see. Indeed, the illusion that we're going to see, we still don't know how it works in the brain. So, all right, so let's, uh, let's have the lights down as much as possible. Okay, I guess this is as low as it's going to go. Oh, okay, that's much better, thank you. So this is motion-induced blindness. And, uh, oops. All right, so you're going to see a bunch of dots. And you need to fixate your gaze as much as possible on the central one. So there's a green flashing dot. Stare at it precisely. But pay attention to the yellow dots. And you will see that sometimes one of the yellow dots is gone, sometimes two, sometimes all three. That's not true. The yellow dots are always physically there. And you can try the experiment. You can ask the person sitting next to you, when you see one or more of the yellow dots gone, ask the person next to you if they're still there. And uh, they, will, they will assure you that they remain on the screen. So it's important that you look uh, very closely at the green dot, paying attention to the yellow dots. Can everybody see the effect? Should I run it again? OK, let's do it one more time just quickly. And this, this time, actually, if you have already experienced the illusion, for those of you who have seen it, don't fixate on the green dot. Just look at the scene naturally, and uh, you will see that the yellow dots uh, remain there all the time. It's not a computer trick. I'm not making them flash on and off. All right. What's that? Uh, you can try. Uh, I, I forget the, the source of this, but uh, uh, you can search for motion-induced blindness. And I, I bet you can find some demonstrations on, on the web. Size illusions. We can see here a coin with a little car model, little supermarket card and telephone. In fact, it's a huge coin. 
and these objects are all real size. <laughs> so everything depends on context, and our assumptions about what the sizes of objects should be. They're telling me I have 10 minutes. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's see how we're going to make this happen. I want to talk a little bit more in depth about face illusions, because the, the illusions that we have been addressing so far if, are about different types of objects. They're not about specific object categories. We can have a size illusion with a huge coin or with uh, basically any other object. And the same thing about invisibility illusions or brightness effects and so on. But face illusions are a category on themselves because we have a specific brain area dedicated to processing and to recognition of faces. And this is the fusiform face area. We have one in each side of the brain. And it is very interesting that we do have this area because we don't have a brain area, say, for chairs or for refrigerators or for any other object. But faces are special, and we have a lot of neural resources dedicated to them. And so they're going, going to have their own specific types of shortcuts that we, we use in, in relevant illusions. So when we look at a scene like this, we're focused on the faces. As we look around the world, the faces catch our attention. If you plot, these are experiments done by a Russian psychologist um, 70 years ago or so, uh, Yarbos was his name. So we presented, he presented pictures like this to people in the laboratory, recorded their eye movements. These are the eye scan paths, and you can see that they focus on faces primarily. This is a recording from my laboratory. Uh, you can see the eye movements of people in real time in the black trays. They're looking at this picture, and you can see that the faces of dogs also attract a lot of attention, a lot of fixations. So people are interested in presents as well, and dogs. <laughs> but you, you, can do, you can do this type of experiment and, and see what people are using their gaze like to, to see the world. Or you can yourselves not try this. We see a father and son. They seem to be enjoying themselves. They have very nice faces. And probably because you're paying a lot of attention to the faces, you haven't noticed that the boy has two thumbs. So that just goes to show you how paying attention to faces sometimes doesn't give you a real interpretation of the world. Or take this family. They're a very close family. <laughs> but you didn't notice at first. For those of you who may not have noticed yet, they all have the same face. Only the hair changes. And that's why nobody notices that Superman and Clark Kent are the same person. So. <laughs> okay, these are famous composites of faces by Archimboldo. You can see the faces very clearly. In fact, there are no, no such faces. It's just composites of fruits and vegetables. But because our face circuits are so well wired up to detect faces, it doesn't matter if the colors are wrong, it doesn't matter if the materials are wrong, if the texture is wrong, we're still going to be detecting faces. Or here. This is a, a more contemporary concept on the Archimboldo composites. I call this the vegetarian's nightmare. <laughs> Another picture by Archimboldo. This one, this one is, a, is a lot of fun. So we see a bowl of vegetables and uh, nothing, nothing much, uh, really. But take the same picture, the same painting, and flip it upside down, and the face becomes very clear. Now, this tells us something important about how our brain processes faces. We only process faces properly when they're right side up. Now, you can imagine that this has some evolutionary adaptive value because there wouldn't be much use to trying to recognize faces when people are walking on their hands. It doesn't happen that often as to give you a survival edge. But that also means that we fall prey to some illusions. Like this one, we see this... Uh, Three attractive women, there's three models, but they're only attractive as long as they remain upside down. If we turn them upside, right side up, 
not so attractive. <laughs> not so attractive. But this tells you that uh, our brain is for processing phases feature by feature, but only is making a global concept that makes sense when the phases have the right orientation. And, and I have to show this one because uh, talk about making attractive people look bad. So these are, these are, uh, this illusion is called Celebrities Turn Ugly. And you're going to see some of the most beautiful people in the world turn into hideous monsters. I'm not kidding you. So, well, Robin Williams is not one of them, but anyway. So, so what you need to do here is look at the, at the cross in the middle and pay attention to the faces. And then the magic will happen. So keep your eyes on the cross, but pay attention to the faces. The faces are just regular faces. They haven't been altered in any way. Meryl Streep, when she comes, she, she really creeps me out every time. So not so pretty anymore. Huh? And you can, you can stop fixating on the cross and just look at the faces for a while, then go back to fixating on the cross. So they all turn into caricatures. And this is because your brain is basically making a comparison between the faces that you're seeing now and the faces that immediately preceded them. Okay, so everything depends on what you compare it to. <laughs> but we need very little information to see faces. And in fact, here you can see that these are called Mooney faces, just with a few features and not a whole lot of detail, we can see faces perfectly fine. Or we can see faces here, again, filling in blanks. This is a, a movie from some years back by Sandra Bullock. We can see her face, but indeed there is no such face. We only have leaves and tree branches and birds, but we can see the face of the actress. It's perfectly recognizable. Or we can see faces here, even where there is no face at all. Or here. Or even here. <laughs> All right, I think we, we don't have a lot of uh, time left, so I'm going to skip something quickly, just very quickly. I want to use the last couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about the Best Illusion of the Year contest that we organize annually. The, the website is illusionoftheyear.com. We're now getting ready to have the 10th edition of the contest, the 10th, the 10th anniversary. Anybody can, can participate. And if you go to the website, you can see there in the Illusions Archive the, 10, the top 10 finalists for the, all the previous uh, illusions, uh, editions of the contest. So we have now 90 illusions in the archive that you can check out. The rules is that uh, the illusions have to be novel of any sensory modality, unpublished or published no earlier than the year before any given contest. And we have an international panel of judges that narrow them down to the top 10 based on a few criteria, including significance, simplicity, sheer beauty, counterintuitive quality, and spectacularity. And this is a word. We looked it up. <laughs> okay, so we, we give trophies to, to the, top, uh, the top 10 illusions compete at a, at a contest gala in, in Florida every year. And the Italian sculptor with the Moretti provides uh, trophies. These are the huge size versions. The, the actual trophy versions are smaller. People can take them home. OK, and the, the contest has had a lot of uh, public impact. There's uh, millions of hits on the website. We've collaborated with museums. We, uh, there's been uh, all over the press. And we write uh, every year a feature article for Scientific American Mind on the top 10 illusions that have participated that you can check out. And I just, just to, to, to wrap it up, I want to show you a couple of illusions that have competed in the contest in recent years. This is the, so you have an idea of uh, just the, the quality and the fun of this event. This is the Leaning Tower illusion by Fred Kingdom and his colleagues. We have here two side-by-side -side pictures of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And if I ask you which one leans 
more towards the right, you would say, is the, the right picture, precisely. However, both pictures are identical. And I'm going to, if you're all familiar with the concept of copy and paste in PowerPoint, then you will see that is the same exact picture. Now, how does this work? This works because our brain has certain assumptions about how perspective works. And these side-by-side -side pictures of the, of the Lean Tower of Pisa, the brain is treating it as if they are two real side-by-side -side objects. But side-by-side -side objects, when you look at them, in reality, as they recede into the vertical distance, they are converging. And because the two leaning towers of Pisa do not converge, because it's just the same picture, left and right, the brain decides that instead they must be diverging. And in fact, if you take one of these two towers from Kuala Lumpur and put the same picture side by side, now they also appear to diverge, and the right one appears to lean more than the left one. And you can see this uh, as well with train tracks, but not with uh, these two girls that are side by side. One of them doesn't appear to lean more than the other, and that is because our brain is not interpreting them as leaning, as receding into the distance. Only for objects that appear to recede in the distance does this illusion work. So I'm going to skip this, and just to wrap up, very last illusion. This is Steel Magnolias by Michael Picard uh, from a couple of years ago. And, and I really like this illusion because uh, something that we see in the contest is that we're seeing a convergence between art and science. We see that illusions that scientists develop are becoming more artistic. People are, are developing a, a greater interest in applying aesthetics to their scientific illusion creations. And at the same time, we see that people coming from an art background, like uh, uh, Michael Picard is a graphics designer, and we have had also painters uh, participate in the contest, and sculptors, magicians, and so on. We see that uh, the art community is also getting much greater insight about scientific principles of um, vision and perception and applying them to their illusion creations. Such this uh, illusion here by Picard. It's called Steel Magnolias. And nothing moves in the, in the illusion that you see here. But all that is happening is that there is a modulation of brightness in the different elements of the illusion becoming lighter and darker, and this gives us the very powerful illusion of magnolia petals and leaves undulating in the wind. Thank you very much. <laughs>